guys. Oh. What Porsche achieves with under those conditions it always amazes me. Like you can get into into a modern Porsche in, in minus ten. And it was the one of the most disappointing cars on track, mainly because less than one lap round, I thought it literally has no brakes left. And it was just being driven by the bloke that had stolen it. Uh, he just put, he put different number brakes on it and was dailying it. And his reason for dailying it was he couldn't afford one, but he really wanted one still. Welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 42, the answer to life, the universe, and of course, everything. Uh, and that's what we're here. We're here to answer everything universe related about the subject of cars, which is why we're the ultimate car bores. And I can sit here with a straight face and say to you that five grown men are now going to discuss ceramic brakes, because that's at the top of the agenda. Ceramic brakes, yes or no? I'm going to go straight to. Edward Lovett, whose family have benefited from the sale of ceramic brakes. They have. There was a period. I, so the, the, the era that uh, I want to talk about is the era of the Ferrari F430, where once upon a time, a Ferrari F430 was about £105,000 new, I think. And a bit more. not... Yeah. Well, not but with the the earlier ones, they might have been a little bit more, not much more. Might have been one hundred and seven or something yeah. like that. And the ceramic brake option was ten thousand pounds plus the VAT, vodka and tonic. Um, and they were bloody hard to sell a set of ceramic brakes. This was also the era that Ferrari decided to tell the dealers that they had to sell an average amount of options per Ferrari they sold, which became very difficult, but a lot easier if you managed to convince your customers to take the £10,000 ceramic brake option. How much? But, what do you mean? How much did, you, did they want you to bump up the base uh, price it, of the it options? Sta it started at about £26,000 per unit. Um, anyway... Uh -huh. Ferrari oh, how, quite... Do you get this in an email or do you get this in a phone? I mean, how, uh, how do you know that? You'll get it uh, from a dad. You, you get it in the mouth it. of the stallion's you, head that's on your you, bed you, when you get back from work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, Ferrari thought they actually made our job a bit too easy uh, in, when we cottoned on to, if we sold ceramic brakes, that would make the job easier. So they decided to put the cars up to about £137,000 overnight. Now it came with ceramic brakes as standard. It also came with a four-year warranty, if you remember. So there was a massive leap in price. But on top of that, you also had to sell another <laughs> £26,000 worth of options. <laughs> Genius. Um, anyway, so th this this was kind of where ceramic brakes were becoming mainstream and, and they be did become put on every production Ferrari. And I, I remember they also told you when these cars were delivered, you, you have to go through a sort of running in procedure, a bedding in procedure for ceramic brakes. And I remember you barrel rolled up the dual carriageway uh, in, in, in Swindon, uh, in, or in your Ferrari with your ceramic brakes that hadn't yet been bedded in. They really did not want to work. <laughs> you had to take them through some heat cycles, which, Chris, maybe yeah. you'll help us understand uh what that's technical meant. yeah it's technical but a ceramic brake that doesn't work is really not very good yeah. but when you get used to a ceramic brake that's very effective it's hard to go, it's hard to want to go back to a steel yeah yeah that's yeah. true so so who can tell me what was the first series production card to have ceramic brakes carbon ceramic brakes on the road 360 Darley. concord doesn't count no, because it's not a series no. production car, Chris Cooper. Series? 360 Challenge for Darling? It was the 996 GT2. Ooh, really? As standard so, or, or as an option? Standard. No, they were standard. And, um, and of course, so Porsche went to, well, Brembo went to Porsche with the technology and said, here we go. They, they've been in motorsport for a while, but the, the brakes they used in motorsport are quite different. They are carbon, carbon. They know carbon, carbon. These are carbon ceramic. These don't have any of the properties of a, of a full carbon brake. They can't operate at the same temperature. 
And of course, they have to last the life of the vehicle. So Porsche, I think it's one of the biggest PR fails in Stuttgart's history. To, to demonstrate how exciting brakes could be for the upsell, they got the car into a tunnel and took loads of photographs of them glowing red hot. Of course, everyone that bought a 996 GT2 tried to replicate this photograph and all the brake rotors exploded or failed. So Porsche had an enormous warranty issue with those first brakes because everyone wanted to get that photograph in the gloaming of their cool, like I'm at Le Mans when I'm going around and about. And they, the brakes didn't like that at all. Um, they, they are, for me, it's an absolute yes yeah. on a Porsche. Uh, on a Ferrari, it's, it's not a question anymore because they're standard. The reasons for me having them on a, a fact, it's, it's a yes on any car they're available on. I know they're lots of money, but most cars now carry more mass than they did, their equivalents did even five years ago. And the only, the only two ways you can hide mass really are through damping and through through brakes. But on the road, it's the brakes that you feel a lot more because quite often you find yourself ha ha herring up to a roundabout. And after three roundabouts, for example, in a new RS6, if you have three good roundabout stops with the steel brakes, they're done. Just three. Because they've passed all their internal tests of one big 150 mile an hour stop and then a one minute cool down or whatever it is. But in the real world, if you're on it, you'll get well beyond the parameters. One area that, that it doesn't seem that manufacturers are quite as conservative as, as you'd think. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's a, it's a must. The, the other reason why is I, a lot of my cars get left outside. And a, and a steel rotor, they're such mild steel. They they fur up and rust and they're horrible yeah. things. Whereas you can come back to a car with ceramics, day or night, leave it there for a month, and the rotors will be all clean and lovely. Um, there's obviously that that uh, unsprung mass benefit. It's a piece of tech that I don't want to be without. But it's still not... If You, you know, I was looking on, it, on the configurator last night for current M5s, non-CSs, you know, comps or non-comps that have got ceramic brakes. Fewer than ten percent are are optioned with them. If you, if you, wow. it's something that people really don't like paying for because they see it as vastly expensive and not very beneficial. But I, I disagree. I think it's a fantastic. It's, it's. I think it might be the first performance extra I tick on on a car. Yeah, and those people on BMW configurators who are not ticking the ceramics, they must be young enough not to remember what standard brakes were like on M cars. 15 years ago, which was... Remember that, remember that of... boss, Gerhard Richter, uh, who was a highly amusing man and a real enthusiast. We're down on the, v the V10 M5 yeah. launch. No, V10 M6 launch at the, yeah. at the race resort, resort at Ascari. And he stood up and he went, I know everyone says our brakes are too small. I'm telling you now, our brakes are the best in the world. And the next day, a Greek journalist just sailed straight on with the brakes on fire into the gravel. It was we extraordinary just, how... Went, I... I, I took yeah, one of those fine. to a track day. We did at the ring when we were racing there. And one of the end of your track days, I had my V10 M6. And it was the one of the most disappointing cars on track, mainly because less than one lap round, I thought it literally has no brakes left. Yeah. Have I, did they, did they stay around at Arenberg or something? It was um, yeah. on, on, a, on, a, on a totally pure level. I think they look great. I think the bigger the rotor behind the rim, the better. Yeah. yeah, there's something about though, particularly on a Porsche. There's something about the way that that bolt that holds that that sort of hub onto the road nice. is that's really appealing, nice. and it looks like high quality aerospace quality fastenings, which I like. And um, yeah. and if you if one were, I'm talking totally hypothetically, if one, for example, were minded to have specified them on a say a Porsche Panamera Turbo S, just randomly, and took that. It's a lovely sausage, uh, <laughs> hypothetically. And if one took that further and said, you know, fit some cup two tyres to it as well, and if one was even further minded, hypothetically, to go to a track day at Donington, a Porsche only track day, then one might find you would humiliate all of the GT3 drivers who thought they were handy. And if that one person, if that one person struggled, if there was just the odd leaf in their yard that they had to go out and re-clean. It would be helpful, given that one person would want silver rims, not black rims, that it didn't gather too much brake dust as well. Definitely. That would help one, wouldn't it? I'm yeah. glad you... Yeah. We might talk about this later or next week, depending on the time we've got, but I, that is definitely true. My only contribution to this is to ask, do these things do... Do they throw out tons and tons of brake dust? No, then the opposite, they don't. 
<clears throat> I didn't think so. No, they're, they're, they're not too bad. Neil Clifford, would you like to offer us the, the, the opinion of, let's say, the committed non-performance driver? Yes, well, I was just considering whether I've actually ever been on it. <laughs> Certainly not from a driving perspective. Being, being from Portsmouth I'm in the 80s. I'm glad you clarified that. Portsmouth, Portsmouth in the 80s, you were always on lots of things, but certainly not driving very fast round roundabouts. On the run? Whatever, whatever Chris gets up to. I do specify them, but mainly because I just like the different coloured calipers. It's a sort of... I knew you were going to say that. It's a, <laughs> you're slightly up the food chain on the sort of showing off car thing, aren't you, when you've got your yeah. yellow calipers, really. Um, I don't think I've ever, I mean, the one car where I specified them, which actually did make a huge difference, was my wife's McCann. Um, very, very rarely, if you do the search on Piston Hedge, you can't find a McCann with ceramic brakes, because obviously it's quite a stupid thing to do when the car's 60 grand and then you've got seven grand's worth of brakes. But the, the yellow caliper and all of that in a navy blue McCann with chocolate leather it really did feel different having ceramic brakes on a McCann. Unfortunately, my wife broke the car in half. So I don't, <laughs> I don't think it exists anymore, that car. I do sometimes search for it on piss and heads. Hopefully it's now like 25 grand or something. But um, Burmeister and ceramics, navy blue with chocolate leather. It's Ooh. probably the coolest turbo nice. McCann. Mm, sounds, right. sounds like you were trying to get a GT to RS, Alec. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately, James has got small ears in Swindon, so I don't think I managed to sort of um, influence it very much. But anyway, the McCann was lovely. Um, just, to, just for anyone listening, Neil doesn't have his microphone today because he's a busy leader of industry uh, and he couldn't have it with him. So he's a bit quieter then turn up the Neil bits because they tend to be better than our bits. Or if you're watching it, I apologise for the fact that you can see his tonsils as he talks into the microphone. I will I will, I will. will talk a little louder if I need to. Uh, Manish, uh, uh, ceramic brakes. Have you driven a car with ceramic brakes or not? Um, yes, I have. What I do have, you think? Um, well, <clears throat> I haven't driven the same model without them. So ah, it's quite yeah. tricky to, it's quite yeah. tricky to complain. It was, um, it was a 458. Um, back in the day, um, I have a photo of it somewhere. And I did have a driver, um, you know, a little expert in the passenger seat telling me where to brake. And um, it was actually quite frightening. You brake much, much later, the brakes feel exactly the same as you go around the circuit. And um, exactly as Neil said, you come out of the whole experience just wanting to stare at how pretty they look inside your wheel rooms. Can, can I, I think, I think in a in a very very gorgeous Tour de France blue four five six M, for example, I think red would be the way to go. That's what I think. You can have a Ferrari will give you a red caliper. Porsche you can do what? Yeah, you can do what? Yeah, yeah. Are, are sticky. So Porsche is sticky on that. It has to be yellow. I think no, it doesn't complain blank. Oh, can you? Speck, you can have a black yes. now, yeah. Okay. You, but you can't have a steel brake with a yellow caliper. No, no. I, I think that speaking to engineers about this back in the day, and it's fairly obvious uh, comment this, um, ceramic brakes have fairly obvious properties. You know, they, there is a range of pad materials that, that manufacturers can choose. Uh, and there's lots of other software stuff that comes with them. It's incredibly clever. One of which I'll tell you about in a minute, which is a good geeky story. Um it's, it's how do you make ceramic brakes work at two degrees ambient in the wet? That's where they initially they didn't work. I mean, the worst of this was the, the McLaren Mercedes SLR. Ooh, you ever yeah. drove one of those? I remember driving a launch car in the morning from a from a hotel to on a photo shoot and just putting my foot on the brake and applying the pressure that my brain said, we'll now stop at the junction. And we just didn't stop. I went straight out across the road. because the, And I, I had to kick the brake pedal like it was a race car to make the thing stop. I mean, we're so far beyond that now. I learned something I learned something the hard way uh, a while ago, and that was on the DBS. The, 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 they're just finishing the DBS, the twin turbo, very powerful one, which, by the way, is one of my favourite cars. I probably told this story already, but I was, I'd was driven from London to, to Chepstow, to the roundabout off Chepstow, where you, on the M48, 
and I, I it was about two in the morning and I don't think I'd actually used the brake pedal I think I had so little traffic and there were no roadworks I just drove all the way down we've lost Neil Clifford haven't we where's he, he he'll come back I'm sure I'll I'll back. Back. and um I was just driving along and I listened to the radio two in the morning and I got to the roundabout if anyone knows it it rises up comes to a roundabout and you, you haven't got much room for error there and I went to hit the brake pedal and nothing happened and, and I just I, I had to sort of stamp on it and then the ABS tried to trigger and I ended up I, I just about maintained control of the vehicle but I almost went down the off slip the other side uh, and I was in a bit of a pickle so I got home went to bed thought about what was going on there and spoke to someone at Aston Martin who said uh, the software that comes with the those Brembo's has what they call a wipe function. So you can choose, it's, it's an on-off switch on the on, on the configurator for the engineers. Most manufacturers, Porsche included, choose to have the wipe on. It means the caliper, the caliper just brushes against the rotor very regularly, takes the surface water off, yep. and just keeps a little bit of temperature in yep. the two components. It's a little bit of friction. You don't really feel it. You're not losing your power. But the person that was leading the that Aston project didn't like the wipe function. Felt that it it there was there was Ooh. a there was some there was some uh, penalty in terms of feel uh, and sportiness in the brake pedal. So just and turn it off. And they and on that model they switched it off. And I wow. and it nearly cost me. Oops. So uh, it was interesting learning about the the property of ceramic brakes. Yeah, uh, and, and it, it it remains to be it has to be told that what Porsche achieves with under those conditions, it always amazes me. Like you can get into, into a modern Porsche in, in minus 10, and somehow the bloody brakes, the stomach brakes work. I don't know how they do it. They just pressure at it than everyone else. That, well, but you I, asked a really good, but you asked a really good question here, which is, is it, you know, are they worth it? Are they worth it for non-performance cars? Do you think they're worth it? No. For, um, right. Absolutely not. Not really. No. I'm, I think if, if, you, if you were to have, so if you were to drive, if you were to have a vehicle of the size and mass of an XC90, let's say, yeah, and you and you had five children and two adults, and you pounded every weekend from London down to your pad in Cornwall, we've had that discussion already. If you did that every weekend and you drove and you and you towed a boat as well, and you were <laughs> going to keep the vehicle for five years and do and do a hundred thousand miles, that might be worth it because you would go through five or six sets of brakes doing that with steels and you you wouldn't need to change them with ceramic so there's it, that if you wanted to extrapolate it out it would be that level of use but you're talking that. about longevity there but just in terms of effectiveness you don't think for an average family no. even if it's a very heavy family car no, no difference cause, yeah because most people on the road quite sensibly and rightly don't use the brakes anything like unless they've completely cocked it up don't use the brakes anything like you would remotely do. When you take people around track, when you do billy days and you take people yeah. around, the thing that most people get most shocked by is how late yes. and how ferocious the braking feels rather than acceleration or... And, and of course, the, in an ultimate stopping time, a carbon ceramic isn't that far away from a steel. The, the yeah, difference not. is that the carbon ceramic can do that repeatedly, whereas the steel does it a couple of times. He's back! Yeah. He's back. He well, I'm is, sorry. He lives. Is, is I tell you what, Neil, that just shows you how boring my carbon ceramic chat was just then. <laughs> you, you just decided to foxtrot Oscar. I think we've covered uh, yeah. carbon ceramic breaks. It's a general yeah. all-round yes from us. If, yes, it is. If you've got the cash. Now, we're moving on to car configurators. Chris Cooper wanted has wanted to do this for the last two months. I'm going to go and get myself a drink. I may be some time... Over to you, Chris Cooper and the car configurator. I can't remember why I was so enthusiastic to talk about this. And then when Monkey said, we're going to talk about configurators, I thought, oh, shit, we've got to talk about configurators. I just think that surely everybody loves a configurator, don't they? It's just that vicarious pleasure of, you know, there are three things you can, OK, there's probably many more things you can do, but keeping <laughs> it on message and in scope of this podcast, you can go on collecting cars which is really good fun. You can look at some classify somewhere else, if, I suppose, if you were interested. Um, or you can go in a configurator. It's just brilliant. It's just that sort of buying, you know, and some the current Porsche configurator, okay, this is niche. Even now you can have the paint to sample. So you can say, you can spend a whole evening saying which shade of slightly dark, off-coloured green yes. that my new 911 <laughs> look nice in. 
I mean, who wouldn't love that? So it's that vicarious pleasure of seeing what the different colour stitching would look like on the seat or different colour wood. And that fantasy of, I've got it. I've got the car. There's nothing like this on the classifieds. May not may not even be on collecting cars. I can get the clear glass I want, the wheels I want. I can change the colour of the wheels. It's my favourite car. And you just, apart from saying, actually, is it possible to spend 170 grand on a Land Rover Defender? Answer, that's yes, scary. it is. That's the, that, is it that's really? The, that's the fun bit oh, and the scary Jesus. bit. Yeah. It's just... Um, my only slight note of caution to configurists is, and some of you may notice this as well, the days when you could literally have Mercedes we were good at this, BMW were good at this, where there were just limitless boxes you could tick of options. Now there are these option packs. Oh, yeah. don't like option packs. The upsell, the, 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 the awful upsell. We don't like option packs because you can't unpick them. Mercedes started it a while ago. He said, "I want, to, I want to pick, I want to pick the rear headrests." But uh, oh yes, if you want to pick the rear headrests, sir, you have to have all these other things over here. The rear headrests are two hundred fifty quid. Everything else over here is seventeen million pounds. That's a, that's a that's a good one. That one, Chris. Yeah, that's yeah. A, so on the Porsche like that. one. That's definitely a pet. Yeah, I don't... Also, who names the packs? They're so misleading. The oh. winter pack. Yes, oh. that's but true. Why does the car need to be set up for winter? Oh, and the BMW stuff that didn't with the business pack. The yeah, the business, 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 business pack. The executive. Pack. But I'm a businessman. You, I know. It. It's just, <laughs> just it reminds me of how offensive those Jaguar model names were twenty years ago when they were struggling to think what do you call the next J6. Why didn't we call it an XJ6 executive? Executive. No. So yeah. I think the, it was actually aimed at you, Mr. C. Probably. I was only 25 then. So, I mean, aspiration. You weren't, you, you weren't 25. Those, 25. Those, anyway. pack, those packs, Chris, was very annoying. If you select on the Porsche configurator, if you want the heritage pack, so you click that, whatever yeah. it is, 16 grand for leather and some stitching. And yeah. Some, and, and then you go down a couple of things and you think, well, I want those wheels. So you click those wheels. And then it comes up with a pop-up box saying you can no longer have the heritage pack. Oh, Do you want to continue? Well, no, no, I don't want the heritage why? pack. Why? I'm happy to pay 16 grand, but I, don't, I want this option as well. Somebody in marketing thought it was a good idea. So the, the bit I feel I'm a bit worried, particularly with Mercedes and BMW now, is that you basically only pick the pack. And worse, worse, Jerry, it's you again. Oh. <laughs> On the Land Rover configurator, some Jerryist or mini Jerry or mini me Jerry has decided there are styles. So here's a style we've chosen for you. No, it's a configurator. I go on and I choose things. I don't want you to tell me what Jerry likes. No. It's so probably Tom and that, Jerry. Configurators Tom and are... Jerry is Tom can and I, Jerry. Can I, yeah. can I, I've got to do something. I don't normally intervene. First of all, uh, no, I do normally intervene. It's my fucking job. Uh, so, uh, First of all, I'd like to apologise to anyone that listened to that last four minutes because we didn't give our best side there. I have to say, we were there. We were there, howling at the fact that you had to buy packs of options on new cars, and we need to hear from Neil Clifford, who no doubt has configured more new cars than all of us put together <laughs> times ten. So, have, how do you configure? I don't like configurators. <laughs> I think it's very odd of me not liking configurators. And I understand why Chris would. I think Chris certainly has a more powerful left brain than me. Therefore, he enjoys things like that, that are all in lovely, neat squares. I do Chris like Wilson, this squares. is, not, not Chris Harris. No, I mean, I mean, I mean the other. Chris Wilson Chris. isn't even on the podcast. Oh, sorry, sorry, Chris Cooper. Sorry, You're talking about. <laughs> I, I'm. I have, a, I have a more powerful right brain than I do a left brain, and therefore I like humans. I like to talk to people and I think configurators have made dealerships, brands and salespeople lazy. So I, I don't I don't use a configurator. I want to I go agree. to the dealership and I want to sit do down both. with a human being. Even if they've got I small to... ears. So small ears, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so I, do not fight with a configurator. There's a few things here. Configurators remind me that I'm not interested in buying new cars. I'm not so uptight about having it just how I want it. I'd rather buy a used car because I'd rather feel the, mm. that warm feeling of value or having nicks at me that someone's over specced for less money. I love that. But the <laughs> idea of finding a little B8 RS4 that's got eight grand of ceramics on it that they, that person now can't make another penny out of. <laughs> yeah. I love. 
Um, I don't really, I, I also have an issue with configurators that are really good, but only there are, there are a couple of percentage points out on color or accuracy. Yeah, yeah that's because rubbish. I, I've only bought two or three new cars in the last 15 years. I'd be surprised if I bought another new car, actually. I'm not sure I need to. But I, I ordered a, um, what was it? That 992 Touring. That was a new car. That was a bit special. Yeah. And, it, and I wanted some colour inside it, and I didn't want to go full Zonderwunsch, you know, 20 grand of shite. You could only have a black interior, really. Yeah. Or you can have this, this dark maroon leather. On the configurator, it was maroon. When it turned up, it was the colour of my dog's cock. You know, it was like bright red. And I, I, actually, it, I got used to it quite quickly, but it didn't look like yeah. it looked like a sort of burgundy from one of those nine to eight interiors from the eighties. I did wonder why I went for that because it did look a bit sudden. I know, but I it looked burgundy, so the yeah. configurator I can, was. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> these, I, these I, things are quite funny, though, isn't it? And just something that Neil said, something you've just said. I think it's about men and online shopping. And what's weird about configurators, it should be about the only acceptable form of male online shopping. Because I, I can't online shop for clothes. Would you do that? I think it's quite tricky because you've got to be able to return them, haven't you? Oh, yeah. You've got, you've, got, you've, got, you've got to order all the men. trousers in 15 different colours and then send all of them back but one. No, but, <laughs> but I think what Neil was saying about being left and right brained, when we were kids, there were no configurators because computers weren't powerful enough. But what we did have were catalogs. Yeah. And yeah. that was the thing about it. A catalog was your kind of mental configurator. You'd look at it. Of course, they've worked out every single combination for you in some way, shape, or form. But the I, I, it's it's quite an obs I think it brings out the OCD in certain groups of people, a configurator. Now I can't so no, same. I I, you know, Tanzanite blue, bloody whatever leather, but the frustrating thing is exactly that. Once you sit and configurate something, configure a car something, you get down to that box and you want something that's a bit off-piste. It does. You, you've got a choice of a 5,000 quid kind of option or not. And I'd love to go into a dealership and sit down with someone over a cup of coffee and actually drive the car. And then he says, okay, how would you like your car spec'd? And you just have a nice... 45 yeah, minutes. So that's fine. Um, we had talked about McDonald's the other week, service stations. And yes, I don't like, I don't like having to go to the burger configurator, which is what it is, on the screen. I just want to go and talk to somebody and say, I'd like that tasty looking burger. By the way, Chris, shoulder. you know why they said they did one. that? I don't know if we talked about it, but you know why they say they use these things? Because people are embarrassed to buy the quantity. Yeah, somebody said that in the comments, didn't they? Just, yeah. It must have not to pay people a wage as well, surely. <laughs> well, I mean, for, for, Ferrari, yeah. Ferrari do it well. If you go to a Ferrari dealership, they've got their shit together on the leathers and the and the carbon. You also have a very, and... you have a pretty woman behind you with a with an iPad going, we'll just make that change for you now, sir. And suddenly yeah. it goes to like whales, penis, uh -huh. leather... But if you go, I, I went to think about buying a 520 Touring in a mannish sort of way because we need a car for the dog and blah, blah, blah. And actually, I won't name them, but the BMW dealership near me, it was a pretty shitty, shoddy service because they've expected you basically to do everything online and you're just yeah. going in there yeah, to yeah. sign the piece of paper. And yeah. there's no paint samples, there's no leather samples, there's no nice room there's no coffee, there's no looking after you as a customer. So I think the configurator is a lot to answer for, that, frankly. Oh, that's, a very, that's a very Agreed. fair Absolutely. comment. It's Chris, a Chris, 60, you... pound, but it's the second most expensive thing you're going to buy. Yeah. And you're and you're basically treated like they're going up to a Ryanair flight and you haven't printed off your boarding pass, aren't you? It's one yeah. of those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Very good way of putting it. Yeah. Chris, yeah. You, you had that. And, and Porsche actually, you know, yes, the configurator is pretty good now and you can go and choose all of the paint to sample colours. But it's very, you know, the, the paint to sample schedule is very difficult. So Chris had this experience. You get a telephone call. No, I need your spec in an hour, please, because I'm submitting it. Well, hang on a minute. I want to come into the dealership and yeah. look, at, look at, so I want to kick some tyres. No, well, you're not going to be able to have this allocation. It doesn't then. work that, that way. The next one. It doesn't work that you, way. See, yeah. I, I, think, I, I think both of what we're talking about is possible. The point about the configurator is it's just that satisfies that curiosity and that excitement doesn't mean you don't want to go in and then yes, have the experience. Enough. And for a long, long time, 
I wonder when you go into a land, you know, these are all first world problems, you go into a Land Rover and you see all those lovely little bits of metal with different colours thinking, when are they ever going to show me those? These look quite interesting and the different yeah. bits of leather and materials. I, can, can we go and sit in that room over there? Why do we never go and do that? I, so, was always, I was always a sucker for a showroom car as well. At the times when I was into <laughs> cars, I like walking into a showroom. I'd have no preconceived idea of what I want, but it would suddenly align itself quite closely with the yeah. one that was there because yes. I just wanted one. So and you'd, you'd convince yourself of all kinds of tat that you suddenly liked because <laughs> there was true. one in the showroom. I, I love the yeah. idea of a showroom car. Yeah, I'm now an idiot like me. I'm. I've been trying to decide how I bring this topic up, and it's something that's on all of our minds, on most of our minds. But you know, we're not brave enough to say anything. But I've found my voice, and I'm going <laughs> to say something. This is a message to all of you out there that feel that you need to go onto a configurator the day a car is uh, is launched, specify it. Rub it into our fucking noses that you've got an allocation and <laughs> a picture of it. It ain't cool. Don't do it, yeah. especially when I haven't been given an allocation. Yeah, for that the is car. true. That is true. We don't like that. We don't yeah. like that. Yeah. Be friendly to your other car friends that haven't been given an allocation. <laughs> I should. Yeah. I should like them, but I. I don't. I, I'm, they're, they're I don't good. like them. Okay. Yeah. Moving on. God, we got that out of the way, thank God. We can revisit that in a year's time. Um, what is your best test drive story? Car test drive story. Manish, have, how many car test drive stories have you got? I'm not, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, because I often feel cruel, like I'm picking you out of the back of the class. <laughs> no, no. The boy that hasn't done his homework. So, <laughs> so I'm not trying to do that. So I'm trying to be kind. What, what's your Have you got test drive stories? No, I've got a test drive story, but I've got four standard test drive stories, but one which I think is special, and it really is um, a little off piece. I had never driven a Ferrari on the road before, and um, it was about ooh, six years ago, seven years ago, I drove my first Ferrari on the road, and it is a test drive story. It's a little abstract, but a friend of mine is a bit of a collector, and he has some gorgeous cars, and he keeps them um, serviced in the Wimbledon area there's a big dealership there and he looks after his Ferraris and uh we went down he said look I know you've never driven a Ferrari on the road and I said well how can you know that and he said well I just know so today you're going to drive you're going to test drive your first Ferrari on the road and I'm going to take you down and you're going to love this so I went in and I thought oh I wonder if it's going to be a 458. I was pretty sure it was going to be a 458, you know, average for our drive. So we go in, go into the dealership, go into the back where they have slightly more exotic things. And he says, this is my beautiful 275 GTB quad cam. It's black. Ooh. And is it's that the ugly just... one? Sorry? Is that the <laughs> ugly one? <laughs> no, you're getting confused, Chris. Very confused, okay? And... He said, we are going out for a drive in this. And I said, I'm not doing it. And he said, yes, you are. You can drive this car. And I said, I'm really scared of driving this car on a public road. And he said, I don't care. It's my car. You can do what you want with it, but you are driving this car. I was so nervous. It also, um, it's left-hand drive, this baby. It was left-hand drive car. So we were out in the Earlsfield area. With that that well-known place that's great for test driving a Ferrari. Out of well, <laughs> well you, you, you may know about it. But it, it, I, I've got to say, it was one of the great life experiences. If you've never driven a Ferrari on the road, you've driven two on a track at, the, at these track days. If you've never driven a Ferrari on the road, to get into a 1966 black 275 GTB quad cam with beautiful red leather inside, just turn the ignition key. Let I just I, I sat in the thing. I, it felt like an hour. It was probably only two minutes just listening to it. You know, just silly little things like winding the windows down using a proper winder. No electric windows. Sitting in the and also the position of the handbrake. I'll never figure out little tiny things like that. And then off we went. This thing went into first, and then it went into second. And it stayed in second. <laughs> and I realised that I, I didn't have the bollocks to drive this thing at more than 25 miles an hour. I was so scared. I was going to practice. He said, 
come on, give it a tiny bit more into third. I was just looking at high and mighty Yarsfield. And I, the thing is, right, you always want, if you want to get into, if you drive a car like that, you want people outside to think, God, that guy is cool, isn't he? Look at him. And I was like this. I was like one of those old grandmas in a burger advert from the 80s in America. You do know, they still, Neil, do they still feel quick, the quad cam? Mine's a two cam. Oh, is it? Does it, does it still feel quite quick? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a four, a four cam feels properly sorted, but I'm not in a two cam. A good, a, all of them sorted feel quick. At 32 <laughs> miles an hour in, yeah. in, yeah. in Earlsfield, it felt quick, okay? Literally. And I remember I just got to a certain point and I just said, that's enough. I indicated, I pulled over and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, so, I do, does anyone know if they've got a mate that's got a 275 that would let them drive it or not? <laughs> Any, anyone not watching this will see all of us looking at Mr. Clifford. Uh, right, so car test drive story, Neil Clifford. I, I don't even. You must no. have a thousand. No, I haven't. I never do a test drive. What? Ah, interesting. Seriously, I, I was. I was thinking, shit. What am I going to say here? Because you know, I've not exactly bought one or two cars in my lifetime. Like an idiot that I am, a, a very authentic addict, one could say. But I. I I was thinking I'm going to have to lie. Don't lie. Because, of course, I don't lie because it's a it's a very rude thing to do. Yeah. I don't I don't do test drives. You know, because? you either want the car or you don't, right? You've read all the magazines. You've you're read quite it, right. You've read, you've read everything. It's just a waste. You're wasting your own time. You're wasting the sales people's time. Don't dick around. Just buy the fucking thing. Also, to confirm your point, Neil, and this is shameful. In my youth, I've been so bought into buying a particular car i've driven to the other side of the country or scotland so when i've got there even though i've test driven it and it's on square wheels and feels like shit i buy it yeah because i decided i was going to buy it so i need this i've decided i'm going to buy it i've got all the i bought it anyway if i know i'm gonna yeah i bought it anyway i don't need to test drive what are you going to do drive you can you've decided yeah i think test drive people they just waste people's time I love it. It's up there with the tyres. Tyres, they're just shit. Um, so here's a test drive story for you. About uh, uh, 2000 and end of 2008, early 2009, end of 2008, car values went down in this country faster than any time uh, before or since. Uh, once Lehman Brothers went under and we hit that immediate recession, um, you could buy stuff very, very cheaply. The irony being that actually... Two months later, what you bought had doubled in value because no new cars had been sold and the motor trade needed to pay for stock. When they were cheap, a garage called Dick Lovett, whose Ferrari uh, franchise has been run by someone called Edward Lovett, phoned me and said, we're trying to lubricate a deal to stitch someone into a whatever it was, but we need to get out of their E39 M5 that had done about 58,000 miles. So I bought it. I think I paid nine or ten thousand pounds for it and it was and it was just probably the best value i've ever bought here it is you remember you might remember i did a video on teaching me how to drift in it yeah Silver. remember that one yes yeah. and that was the yeah. car anyhow fast forward a year we've had lots of fun with it but it's time to move it on so it goes to a friend a guy that had a garage nearby me near chepstow called chris clinkert who might listen to this i don't know He's clink card cars clink card cars and no 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 clink it's car. not clink card. it's not clink a different card. one it is. Yeah, it yeah. is now clink card, and he's he, yeah. no, he's part. Sorry, Parva cars. Yeah, Parva yeah. cars. And he's 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 now up on the uh, A40 near near Ross on Y. Anyhow, so Chris has it on SOR at his garage near it's St Arvin's near Chepstow, <laughs> and a bloke turns up to test drive it, and he goes for a nice test drive, drives it quite briskly. When he comes back, I think one of Chris's sales persons is in the car. The guy suggests that he might want to get out of the car because he's holding a large knife and he decides he's decided he's going to take the vehicle, but he doesn't intend to pay for it. No. So, <laughs> so, the, so the salesman leaves driving a hard bar and just and just and just goes, She's all yours, sir. Full tank of fuel. <laughs> and off his, but, and his, my E39 M5 disappears at speed back towards the back towards England over the bridge. I get a phone call from Chris saying, if you got a tracker on it, I go, of course, of course I've told the insurance there's a tracker on it. Of course I haven't turned it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a standard thing. But Chris is clever. So he phones up every, he works out, it's an E39 M5 that must be whatever, 
a tech nine years, eight, nine years old, it must have had every tracking device on it that's been turned on and then turned off because people haven't paid the subscription. So he phoned the three main tracking people, gave the chassis number. They said all of them had a beacon on there. So he switched all the beacons on, paid no. them, and told me it's going to cost you a couple hundred quid. So we did that. And then we left it to the police who, um, who found the vehicle two days later in the Yeovil area. Um, and it was just being driven by the bloke that had stolen it. Uh, he just put, <laughs> he put different number plates on it and was yeah. dailying it. And his reason for dailying it was he couldn't afford one, but he really wanted one still. <laughs> he was in the Oval. Yeah. In the Oval. And, and, the, and the car was given back without a scratch on it. It even it was cleaner after it had been stolen than when I had it. But that it was a full knife point, I'm taking the vehicle, and there we go. So it wasn't me. That was my test drive story. Um, uh, Chris Cooper. So I think test drives are all right, because, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, for a long, long time, I had a real hankering after an Austin Healey. Yeah. And there's an outfit that's based in the old Cape Works, the Austin Healey, I mean, Warwick somewhere, where Austin Healey were originally built, Donald Healey. And an outfit is in there now, producing beautiful, sort of resto modded, restored Austin Healey's. And they had a 100M, the Le Mans replica type yeah. car. It cool was a thing. bit more grunt and, you know, handling kit and blah, blah, blah. And I've been a couple of years thinking, God, I really like trying. I mean, never, I thought, I've no idea what it's like. It looks lovely. Mm -hmm. The idea is lovely. And so I thought, I can't, I can't just take the plunge. I've got to, you know, do I even fit the bloody thing? So you've got to sit in it. Otherwise, you don't know whether you fit the bloody thing. That. I've talked, talked about it a while, a while ago, that Audi, the Gen 2 Audi Spider, Gen yeah. 1 Spider I fit, Gen 2 I didn't. And you sort of, if, if you're sat in the show and thinking, well, I'll find a way of getting into it, but you 100 yards down the road, you think, I don't bloody fit it. So I kind of think there is an argument for it. But with this Austin Healey, it, it was it's just dreadful. It was just, it just didn't do anything for me at all. And it was <laughs> it was very disappointing because I'd, I'd been looking at them forever Every bloody magazine website, and I've never looked at them again. Who's I've the never family? Looked at them ag I've never looked at them again because mm. I had a go in one. But so, who's the family down on the A three hundred three that do those brilliant Heelys? I don't know. I should think I know who that is. Is that near Chicklade? Well, 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 I'll come. It to it. Okay. I say, Crystal, Crystal's got its own uh, Healy hero. That's John Chatham, isn't yeah, it? John Chatham, yeah, John Chatham. Yeah. Him. yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, met John so, Chatham at a pub two weeks ago. He's he's old guy now, but his yeah. son. So my best, the business, but... but my best test drive story. It wasn't the fact I wanted a test drive in an F10 M5, in which one of my sons fell asleep, and I thought that's probably not exciting enough because he's falling asleep <laughs> in it. So I won't get that. But the best one was a few years ago. It was when the 968 Club Sport came out, and I'd been on to the motor show stand or whatever it was, and I got. It was when a guy called Kevin Gaskell was running Porsche Cars Great Britain. Really interesting guy, quite commercial entrepreneurial. And he thought, well, we're going to try and get new customers because old world Porsche was, well, customers find us. Duh. Kevin Gaskell's view was, no, that's not, we're not going to grow the business. So I got nabbed on the motor stand and said, would you like to drive one? We'll, we'll, we'll arrange a test drive for you because I'd like you to drive the car. Um, so I went down to a dealership in Kent and I discovered by accident that if you're about to test a two-seater car and you arrive with a friend, actually my brother Mike at the time, they were they were too embarrassed to say, your brother can't come with you. <laughs> you can both go out. So it would have been mid-90s, and it was uh, somewhere near, just in Maidstone, lots of big motorway, big roundabouts, big sight lines. You can see what's happening, big sight lines. So we just hooned it. We just hooned it. And I could tell you, I, I'm, I didn't buy that one, but I did buy one later. Um, it was just that test drive. Sorry, uh, that would have been Lind Motors, Lind Porsche of yeah. Mesa. Life in a new dimension. Uh, is that what it was? Yeah. I wow. Didn't know that. Didn't no. know that. Wow. Yeah. Life in a new... Yeah. That's amazing. So Mug up that... on the competition. So just drifting this thing, it was, just, it was like that much lock around this roundabout. I thought that was wonderful. I, so, so I think there's a place for test drives. Maybe it could do it I've, I've definitely got plenty of stories of how I should have done a test drive. 
Because <laughs> when I've actually bought the car and my legs don't fit under the steering wheel, I've got yeah. plenty of those. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing I used to do, and I'm very glad I did. I'm, I'm not as anti-test drives as Neil said. I think sometimes when I've just got the, you know, the dog with the bone, I want the car. I won't allow a test drive to dissuade me from the obvious. But there are times when I have discovered things about cars that I couldn't live with. Or that I they were they were just so disappointing, even I couldn't offset them against my need to own that vehicle. What yeah. I would do when I was testing cars is I would if I thought something wasn't quite right, I'd go and drive a normal one. And I, and more often than not, it just exposed how hooky the car industry was with their test cars. And I've written about that extensively. I want to bore people, but I remember yeah. being given an Octavia VRS when they first came out. And in fifth gear, it had roll on acceleration like a cocking bentley it was ridiculous it was so talky so i um what's he got oh he's got tea i think gonna show yeah, us yeah, finley i think he's gonna show us sorry finley i was just about yeah i was about to just show i thought you're gonna show us a mounted picture of finley um <laughs> so i i went down to the local skoda dealer in the vrs that i'd been given to test uh and i had a stopwatch from work and i went out on the dual carriageway in the test car and did 50 to 70 in fifth gear and I did it in their demo car, and it was not even in the same time zone. So it just confirmed wow. the, the test car was bent. Uh, I'd always try and get a go in, in, uh, in let's say, a certain Italian brand as well. I'd go and test drive their cars because I wanted to confirm it was all a bit wrong. But when I was younger, I used to love blagging test drives, you know, get a shirt on, have a shave, go in there with some bullshit story. Get or The phrase that you, you, Chris has used is getting on the motor show stand. You know when they used to have the, they'd have the, the, the special the rope. The rope across, yeah. get behind the yeah. rope, walk in, suddenly your, your public school accent would come out. You'd try and tell them some cock and ball that you're in a market for a 993 Turbo. And they'd go, what car do you drive now? And I can remember this this perfect pattern. I was with a mate of mine who has an impish sense of humour. And I was, he said, what car do you now drive now? I was about to say M, uh, E30, E36 M3. And my mate went, 106 XSI. <laughs> That's a better I mean, answer. And they invited me to leave the stand. <laughs> short-sighted, short-sighted. Um, so, you know someone um, um, on Friday, just talking about test drive, the, the, <clears throat> he tried to convince me not to get this 456M. He said, oh, you haven't driven one. I said, well, I don't think I'll be driving them. No, no, they're going to go wrong. You won't fit. There's no room in the back. I mean, gave me a whole long... Makes me want to buy one so much more. There's a 456 yeah. manual live on the website now, Manish. Go and have a look. Yeah. It's in it's blue Sierra, the only yeah. car built in that not, color. It's, it's, a, one it's, of a, one. it's, it's a, not a modificato, though. No, no, not a modificato. It's, hey, but it's what's not your favourite test drive story? And it can't be the well, one where you put me in a car with a celebrity who crashed with me in it as he was having the test no, drive. No, well, that's one of them. I've not tried that with the lawyers yet. <laughs> I could talk about a McLaren F1, which also involved you, but I'll leave that one for another yeah, day. We don't need that I, one. I think the test drive stories are probably not my stories. They're probably the stories of my customers. And as a salesman, I always wanted to make sure the customer knew exactly what the car could do. So <laughs> oh, there he is, chubby cheeks there. There's monkey in the McLaren F1. I'm sure it had seatbelts in it. That was taken by the Swindon Police Force. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I I used to, I always drove um, the customers first when I took them for a test drive, which was probably a stupid thing to do because I set a very bad example of what I would expect. Is we're very lucky in Swindon because I'm not sure if anyone's aware, but Swindon's one of the only um, places in the world outside of Germany where they actually have an autobahn in the town. And there's an autobahn that goes from the Ferrari dealership to the motorway. There's no speed limit up there. Yes, you can do I've whatever you that. want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's quite effective. And I I like to just show about 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 30 seconds after leaving the dealership what what the speed capabilities were of the car. The aerial atom always caught them by surprise, I think, because it also <laughs> drifted beautifully around the roundabouts. And a, and, and, and a nine, 996 GT2. I don't think we can get busted for this, Chris, can we? Because this no, is... No, 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 limitations no. Means this is fictional. This is fictional. Um, but yeah, I like to do that. But I was thinking about a test drive that I had. And there is one that I remember in a very fond way. Um, and it was my first experience driving this. 
Oh. Oh. Which is a oh. 1974 three-litre RS, uh, RSR, sorry. And th- I, I drove this car in the hills above Monaco. We went, we went minus three stories underground. And there was this guy in Monaco who was starting to deal in with these cars. I'm not sure all of them were straight. Some of them were a bit hooky. I think this one was legit. And uh, th- th- this was a car that was sold new to the UK, and it was 30,000 kilometres, totally original. Shit. Um, and we went up the hill, up, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the town, just um, the, the village. Well, they filmed the Ronin car chase round Yeah. There. But that car, you know, when you get into a car and you drive it for the first time, and it surprises you, it surpri- how fast it is, how visceral it is, and to do it in that environment, that's the car that I don't think I'll ever forget, both being a passenger in and driving. He scared the life out of me when I drove it, paying me back for all of the test drives I've, I'd done. And as soon as I got in it and started driving him, I think I scared <laughs> the life out of him in about 30 seconds as well. Sometimes, and also sometimes the brief exposure in a test drive can leave a more powerful impression because it's gone. It's not going to be repeated, you know. If, if, mm. I, I often realise that when I, I, I always give people a ride in nice cars. I've got a test car or something. And as a kid or an adult that wants to have a go, I just if I've got a minute, I'll say, "Come down the road." And I always think that must linger. That must be like yes. a, you know, a yeah. glass of, you know, Petrus is only special if you have it now and again, isn't it? You know, it's. So I, I think uh, there's something there is something powerful about brief exposure to cars that that we all have to acknowledge. Yeah, that's totally but, right. And I remember. Um, there was one other area of test driving that all these car companies got involved in, especially the Lovett family, which was the corporate golf day. It was another chance to get in, get get sort of more exposure to a car because <laughs> the DP or whoever would bring a nice new M car or a Porsche and you'd drive together to the golf day. So when the F10, no, when the E90 M5 was new, no, E6, sorry, E60 M5, the V10 bugger, um, there was a nice blue demonstrator at Dick Lovett. And um, Edward decided to take myself and a bloke who I'd not met before, who I bumped into not long ago, not, not a few years ago, uh, to this golf day at Bowood House. Great golf course, Bowood. So we go to the golf course. Edward drives there in what um, Murray Walker would describe as a spirited manner. Um, and let's just say the other residents of Wiltshire were well aware that there was a bloke in an M5 wanting to get somewhere on time. Great noise, though. Uh, when we got to the golf course, they had this amazing lineup of Scotty Cameron putters. They had the full range of Scotty Camerons. Anyone who plays golf knows these are beautiful putters. And we could just putt away. And I'm not that talkative, as you know, with people I don't know. And uh, this guy comes up to me and he's wanting to talk. And I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go. What do you want to talk about? And he's just putting and he just says, Can you drive home, please? <laughs> <laughs> Little did he know. <laughs> um, now, um, there was a Formula One race at the weekend uh, in Las Vegas. It wasn't in a car park. Uh, uh, however, it was perhaps the most controversial Formula One event of the last five years, I think. Yeah. Oh, actually, okay, Lewis versus Max, maybe. But this has garnered a lot of a lot of negative press. The outcome probably wasn't what people expected. Uh, Manage, kick us off. <clears throat> so I think you're spot on. There are two parts to this, aren't there? There's what happens on track when it eventually sort of happened. And there was all the build-up before. And um, I have to say, um, I was very mildly spect- sceptical. And <clears throat> the scepticism hit an absolute height. Does anyone know the name of the guy? Who does those driver announcements? I mean, you must have seen mm. what, the guy does the boxing. The, the Leonard yeah, I, Lewis announcement. He's, he's I, the guy that does the. He's the let's get ready to rumble. He's not the same. Yeah. So, the so guy. If, if you saw, was it not the boxing guy. No, not the boxing guy. No, no it was okay. the boxing guy. It was a boxing guy. Oh, he is a boxing guy, isn't he? Yeah, but it, the, there's, there's that skinny grey haired guy that does the boxing. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't All right, him. no. So okay. we're talking, but there's a wonderful, wonderful little clip. I mean, if you if you saw Sergio Perez comes up, and he goes, "I'm three times running, 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 like that right in Sergio's face, and Sergio stands and goes. Where am I meant to go? Where am I meant do to I go? Speak now? <laughs> what, do I, what do I do now? 
one knows what to do. And it was just one of those moments. It was just so cringeable. You thought, oh, no, I don't, I don't really understand what this is all about. But I got up for the race. I got up for the race. And I, again, I, I think the thing about these night races is that they are a bit of a much of a muchness in terms of how you can film them. So if you're in Saudi Arabia or Singapore or um, Las Vegas, because of the way the track has to be illuminated, cameras are not like your retina. Cameras can't see a sort of hotel casino sign in exactly the same way that they can see a bright track. And so they set the apertures on these cameras, the exposure on the cameras, obviously for the on-track action. And if a camera's low, it's what you have as a track. You have these steel walls, which are basically you know, the mesh on the side, uh, the mesh fences on the side. And maybe you can make out something apart from this sort of incredible sphere. So when I watched the qualifying, I was sitting there thinking, well, you know, this could just be any other race. Uh, you know, it could be any of those. There wasn't anything particularly Vegas about the race. And mm. then the high shots, which show you you're in Las Vegas, again, you, if you turn the exposure up so that you can see the strip, for example, the actual track just looks like a day glow toothpaste tube. I mean, it's just so bright so you can't see the cars. And I was thinking, well, you know, how special is this? And what I would say is that then seeing Max Verstappen's two minute, very thoughtful sort of interview on the percentage of race versus percentage of show, I was thinking, oh, but I have to say, I thought the race was absolutely cracking because we had no grip. We had the street circuit where they were doing 200 miles an hour. Nice. 16 corners, you know, and, and, you know, there was overtaking opportunity after overtaking. And ironically, the man in a way who criticized them, the race the most, Max, made the race. Everything he did made this race amazing. By even that first maneuver into Leclerc, forcing him off, that suddenly generates a bit of a race. Actually smacking into um, Russell made the race even more. I mean, Leclerc, that race could have been Leclerc going off six or seven seconds ahead, and that's where it stayed pretty much all the way through. But because of all the on-track incidents, we even got a last corner, last lap overtaking maneuver. And again, ironically, with um, with Perez. So I, I was absolutely gripped by the race and it made all the rest of the weekend utterly irrelevant. And I realized, and this is the point of this, they didn't create all of that guff for me. And do you know what? I'm grown up enough to have ignored all of that guff. I could just have gone, forget it. I don't need to watch that. And could have just focused on the bit that I want to take from it, which is hopefully a good race. And, and, and my final point would be, I think there was a slight lack of courage of perhaps Liberty's conv conviction in setting the late so late, setting the race so late in Las Vegas. If they really wanted to go after the American market, then that race should have been at 7 p.m. till whatever. And sort of like, you know, we can get up or not and watch it or record it on the TiVo box. And I think that's what the teams have turned around and said, look, proof of concept, great. But if you want to generate all of that hype and create a race which is all about America, do it for the American time, because there's no point in trying to get some poor guy in Miami or New York to turn his TV on at one in the morning. Mm. Yes. Watch your race till three. Fun. Make us suffer. Go for the yeah. American market. Just yeah. go. For it. Have confidence. I, I completely agree. Uh, so I, I didn't. It's the first race this year I've not watched because I just the timings were all over the place. I couldn't work out what was going on. Um, the, the build up to it was, I think, shambolic is the only word you can use. It was. Uh, it, it it looked like it could be really bad to the point where, at one point, I feared that someone could get injured, a driver could get injured because it didn't look like it had been properly thought out. Um, the race, from what I've heard, was spectacular. Um, but looking, looking, taking a step further back at it, I totally agree with Manish's view that. If, it's, if you're going to go there to win the hearts of the Americans, then give them the race weekend. Don't don't appease us over here. Uh, I, I, I believe that. I also think that the, the way they treated the paying spectators was poor. Uh, you know, the people were expected to pay a shed load of money and all we all over social media, all over Instagram and TikTok with people just going, all I can see is a bog and a bit of concrete and what have you, and I paid three grand. 
it's not a great look. And there was so much of it, I don't think it was people being malicious. Um, and I, so I don't, I'm not sure. This event was an investment by Liberty to bring in a younger audience and an American audience. And also to, to just generally, it was a marketing punt to win favour with the American public. I think as a racing spectacle, it appealed to all of their existing audience. I'm not sure it won any new hearts and minds. I think we just all thought it was surprisingly good and a great yes. race. But I'm not, I'm not, most of the people I've spoken to who are my American friends went, the race was good, but the build up just proved how good NASCAR is. Mm. You know, how, how well much, organized. Just out of interest, how, how much is it to go to a NASCAR race or an Indy race? Indy won't be that. I mean, Indy, in, Indy, Indy, Indy can't fill the grandstands. They have to give tickets away. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and NASCAR is now average TV. NASCAR is really now as well. Uh, I mean, it still gets more than F1 in the US, but the NASCAR TV audiences, there's a bunch of drivers, a generation of drivers in NASCAR, the Jimmy Johnsons and those yeah. who, who kind of retired. So NASCAR is definitely struggling and Indy is um, really, really struggling. So I, I, The only reason I say that, I saw a video earlier on of like how many private jets there were at Vegas and it was sort of, there's no recession, there's no shortness of wealth, but yeah. it, F1 is so focused around luxury and high end that they think you need to go and have these you know, fifteen hundred dollar fruit baskets or or, or whatever. <laughs> you know, that, that it kind of it, it's all about luxury. Sorry, two seconds. I, I um the, the the other observation I make is that I am I am becoming a Max Verstappen fan. Oh yes. I, I just I, I've now realised that I like I like ninety two percent of Max. The eight percent I don't like is when he comes into contact with other drivers. And the assumption is that unless they get out of the way or or become invisible, they're then hit they're at fault. Basically, in a 50-50 contact position, I find his utterances quite difficult at times because I don't think he ever sees the other side. But the rest of it, he's a racer's racer. I believe he's totally authentic. I believe he he wants what's right for people that are hardcore. He wants to look after the older F1 audience. And he, he's, he's willing to look for a new audience, but he's not yeah. willing to squander or disrespect those that have followed the sport for many decades. And I respect that. I really do. I think whenever he opens his mouth now, I want to listen. Whereas, yeah. whereas last year, I didn't. I really do now. One one thing just, um, it, which I thought was just so telling about Max, I can't remember. I think it was Martin Brundle talking about it. And um, Max had actually been on the simulator for ages and ages and ages before he came on. And I think it was Brundle who said to him, um, I said to him, what, what are you doing? You're kind of world champion. You've won 17 races this year. You know, why are you on the Vegas simulator? And I just thought this was an extraordinary thing to say. And it shows you who the guy really is. He said, well, you know, I'm not going to turn up there unprepared. You know, my team have done whatever. I want to win it. Yeah. Just, oh, God, yeah. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll be on the go. simulator because, you know, they've got to learn the track. And you know, sure. I mean, I, I think it was... We might come to regard Vegas as the Porsche Cayenne of F1 tracks. When yeah. the idea was originally mooted, it was the purists were, oh, my God, you can't be serious. Um, what a travesty. What's the world? You know, all of our values have gone to pot. And then when it arrives, we sort of start to realize, well, you know what? It's sort of if, you know, the argument goes, if Vegas and stuff like it means that Spa can remain on the calendar, which makes no money for anybody. Uh, I'll never really make money for anybody, or Silverstone or Monza, then great. And, you know, and actually, a bit like the Cayenne, when you actually try it, you think, it's not awful. It's the, per in the, many ways, it's the perfect city for it, given, it's you know, the, the locality, so, the hotels, the infrastructure yeah. around it. You know, you can go and, you know, you don't have to pile a load of people into the countryside. My only, the only sort of slight, I was talking about it, I was at a, a, an industry event today, uh, and this came up obliquely, which was uh, Lando's accident, which was actually mercifully reasonably significant. Um, he was clearly, he sat in the car for a bit afterwards. And I, you know, my instinct was he was probably thinking, what the just happened? Yeah. That was, that could have been an air crash. Yeah. Um, it was doing 200, I mean, they're doing 213 miles an hour, 1.2 miles straight. 
Um, and if anything goes wrong, it's you just it's dental records territory. So Ma- I Martin do think- said something. Martin was stood on one part of the track, didn't he? And he said at this point they're doing 250 miles an hour. And if so- if someone has an off in any capacity here, yeah, it, it we'll be sweeping it up with uh, with a dustpan and brush. Yeah, and, uh, mm. and I think he was clearly. I mean, it was just dreadful. There's a tiny little bump in the circuit. He just slightly offline, been behind the safety car, tire pressure down, hit the bump, and it just woof gone. So that and Jed is a bit like that, uh, although Vegas has got fewer blind high speed entries apart from the last corner. That last corner just looks awesome. So the track to race one is great. So I think we'll come to see it possibly as a Porsche Cayenne of F1 tracks. The deal being to keep the, the good stuff. Hmm. Um, no, I think the Rasmataz, we said it's about Miami. In Miami, I thought they undercooked overstatement. Yeah. Nobody could accuse Vegas of undercooking. No. Yeah. Uh, Neil Clifford, what do you think? Did you watch it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I thought it was, the race was fantastic, wasn't it? It felt like you were back in the 80s or 90s. You had people actually racing against each other, overtaking. You know, it was back to mid 90s or yeah. whenever peak F1 was for me. So I thought it was great. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of Vegas. I have to go there for work. You know, we've discussed that before. I think you only can do Vegas at night because, frankly, it looks shit in the day. Yeah. So they've got really no choice. I think for people that have not been to Vegas, I'm sure you look at that and thought, wow, that's quite an incredible place. Maybe I need to go there. I think you're right to say if you're aiming at kids, I mean, there's no way I was going to get my son up and there's no way he would want to get up at six in the morning. So they sort of miss the young people anyway, because I don't think it's that important to them to get up at six. So maybe that's a bit tricky because it's too late in America and too early in Europe. So, yes, we probably it's the hardcore people that get themselves out of bed to watch it. But the race was brilliant, wasn't it? It's was really what time good. is sunset in Las Vegas, Neil? Probably it's eight or something, because it's sort of <laughs> it's, it's it's probably eight or seven because it's sort of winter there now. It's bloody cold at night. You see all yeah. the coats on. Yeah. What, um, does anyone else find these night races faintly ludicrous but with F1's eco message? And you've got all these lights on. I mean, I, I know the sport is hilariously hypocritical but that is right up there for me when they light the entire circuit oh yeah lads it's all yes. about the environment yeah <laughs> is I it know, not solar is... they are in the desert they get a lot of sun during the day can they not power it with solar i, yeah. I think <laughs> I, I i think we'll find it probably wasn't <laughs> yeah right um lads we've got one other topic that we agree we're not going to do that we're going to bump that to next week because we're yeah. already uh, up on an hour and 10 minutes and i think we need to move on to our two-car garage for this week, which all of us have agreed. There's a right little perler of a two-car garage. This from Ricky Bobby 7660, as surfaced by one of the Cooper boys. I can't remember which one. Cameron. Cameron. Well done, Cameron. Um, here we go. Um, right. Oh. You want me to read it? No. I got some readers on for the benefit. <laughs> I can't read my... Sorry, it's been one of those weeks. Here we go. Here we go. Here's a two-car garage for you. Totally not. Uh, Troubles, you come in behind me. Sorry, but I've got my my uh, the my, my the cleverer half of my life wants to come in from the shops. Um, uh, here's a two-car garage for you. Totally not asking for a friend. <laughs> you're, you're in your late forties, an ex-British superbike champion, and still rolling around in the top fifteen. Humble brag. So not made of money, but got a shed full of twenty-five years worth of free swag. And you spent the start of the off season eBaying like your life depended on it. They all do. They're <laughs> wonderful. They're hustlers. Your wife has had enough of you. Uh, racing and the I'll be in MotoGP one day. And she's done a runner with your dentist, taking your house in the Midlands and your C7 RS6 event. I love that. The fact that he specified it's a C7 means you might be able to believe this one's real. You now find yourself with 120 grand the tax man doesn't know about. And need a couple of vehicles, a respectable yet somewhat practical daily to schlep yourself and your practice bike around, be it a boogie van or a Tati estate and trailer. And something befitting your age, yet engaging, fun, and most importantly aspirational to your much young, your much younger, faster peers. But you're a super bike racer, so no supercar is ever going to hit the spot like a bike. So it has to be something more visceral. What do you buy? 
Uh, just beautiful. And then, by Ricky the way, Bobby. Ricky Bobby, you should be writing for a living boss. Um, I'm going to go straight to Neil Clifford's. Well, I think it's a brilliant two-car garage. Um, I'm going to do the most neutral, vanilla, plain, run-around thing that I can possibly name. Actually, one of them came up earlier, and I, I don't know much about these cars, be it that I'm sure they're brilliant, actually. The Skoda Octavia. Yeah. And the name is about 50 million letters long, isn't it? Because it's something like VR6, 2-litre, TSI, RS, DSG, 245. God knows what that all means. But it's a car that will outlive you. And if you see your wife in the street and she's going to think, oh, well, he's he's got a plain old car. It's probably quite a fast thing. You get the estate version. You can put your bikes on the back on a trailer and it will never, ever, ever, ever break down. So because I'm saving all the bloody money that I possibly can to get, in my view, the closest thing to a motorbike. So I'm going to buy an aerial nomad R. And I think they only made five of these things. In fact, there was one yeah. on collecting cars, wasn't there, quite recently? There was. And, this is um, the vehicle that was built as an off-road buggy, then converted to be a road car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's got it's got everything on it. The supercharger, that special bloody gearbox thing, whatever they're called. It's got that. I had one of these mm-hmm. things, and it did eight hundred miles in it, and I got rid of it mainly because Ed would love it. Copied my specification. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that, that, that's another conversation that we had. But actually, he's going to love a Nomad. And there's only five of these things. They're about 100 grand. They're silly money, be it that they're probably 70 or 80 grand now. But the closest thing to a motorbike probably would be that. And you'd have extreme joy. You can take your new, younger, better-looking girlfriend that you've got in, the, in it as well. So you can go away for the weekend. You can get a little roof on it. Um, no heater, but you get the little Tom Tom sat nav. Bloody brilliant things. Um, so that's what I would buy. Uh, Spanish, what are you going for? Oh, did you? Get, can you hear me, Manish? What, what would you go for? Okay, okay, here we go. Sorry, just um, I actually thought since he was approaching middle age and he did want to bike a little bit, I had a quick look at luxury off grid. Sprinters, the Mercedes Benz Sprinters, and some of the kind of bits and pieces people have done. And there are some good videos, mostly of Americans who modify these. It's a so brilliant cool. husband and They're wife. So cool. Cool. A husband and wife combination. You sit there and talk about you can put, you know, you can go inside one of these and there's a little cubby hole for your for your plimsolls or your boots or whatever. But the one that I found, I found this thing, 55000 pounds It was a Sprinter 313 CDI. It's got all the stuff that you would have, you know, you'd have your bed and you've got your little tube gas burner and a sink and a loo and a shower. But this one, the back of it had been modified thus. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, you, a lot of that stuff you, on Insta. Yeah. Lot of looks, like, looks like a marijuana farm. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's got a little, it could be. You, you put your bikes in, it's got little. He's a t- biker. I, yeah. I just I thought fifty five thousand pounds, and that leaves me sixty five thousand pounds. Now I went onto a rival website. <clears throat> At the beginning, this sounds boring, but you'll see why a biker might want to buy this. So there was a two thousand and sixteen Corvette C seven. It was seventy thousand pounds, and it was reduced to sixty five thousand pounds for Black Friday. And this is what the guy explains. He says, and "I just have to read this." He sent it to Top Cats Racing. Who, where, I quote, I had them pull the engine and strip it down to the bare block. From there, we replaced every part possible with something bigger, better, stronger than factory. Forged pistons, rods, mm-hmm. crank, up studs and bolts. Uprated seals, better head gaskets, etc. You know the deal. To produce 1,000 horsepower <laughs> by a Pro Charger DX1 Supercharger. I had to actually look this thing up. You would, this would not have been out of place on Alain Prost's MP4A. It, it, it's 4.4. It was big. And this is the last bit. The car was tuned by the best Gen V tuners in the United States. Goat Rope Garage at great expense. 
And as a result, any future modifications or tweaks you may want to make are also covered by the tuner. The car has more than enough fueling to support the power. However, the octane in the UK in UK fuel is pretty pants. So it's supplemented with a methanol system. <laughs> I will throw in remaining containers of my mess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just to finish this, you know, we don't like we don't like back windows that are colored in, but look at this. You get the stuff. America. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's good. 65,000 yeah. pounds, 120,000 quid. I think all the kids are going to be looking at me in my 1,000 horsepower meth powered Corvette. Top cat. Yes. That's a guy, a guy called Warren Gilbert runs that. I used to race against him in cage rooms. He's been top, on top doing... cats racing. Uh, Edward Lovett, two car garage, please. So Neil went for, I was, I, the first car I thought about was an Atom and then I reread it and I thought he didn't want something because nothing is going to perform like a motorbike. So I've tried to go slightly different to that. But anyway, my, the, the car to get the bike around, I've gone for a Grand Cherokee SRT10. Oh, a good. Trackhawk supercharger oh, yeah. of 707 brake horsepower. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much they were on. I was on the plane. I didn't have any Wi-Fi. So I, I'm, I, that set me back however much it set me back. And with, with the change, however much I've got left, I've decided to buy an NSX. Because I think that's sort of a car that would probably leave a bit of intrigue with my friends. Why have you, why have you gone NSX? Take the keys. Go have a few laps. You'll know why in a moment. Go and have one lap before the brakes fail. And enjoy exactly, the steering yeah. while you yeah, fine. do. Go and do one uh, lap. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris Cooper. So I, th I think Neil's sort of on the. I was very similar lines to you, Neil. And um, it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, you it often argue that a caterum is the one car bikes look at, but it can't be any caterum. So there's one that another bloke I used to race with, Luke Stevens. He's got a business called Team Leos. On his website right now is a Caterham CSR with, a, I think it's probably a 2.3 Durotech engine, 330 horsepower in a Caterham. What are you supposed to do with that? That's just, that's just plus, terrifying. Plus, it's got all the kit. Sadev, Geartronics, if you know, yeah. you know. So basically an automatic gearbox with paddle shift, so clutches up and down shift, 330 horsepower. That that would get respect to Ricky Bobby's much younger, faster uh, colleagues. I think you'd also have got to have a 530 diesel estate and a Brian James trailer to put your caterer in and your bikes and Ricky Bobby 7660. Well, your race shuttle is going to put you out of budget straight away, isn't it? Because there are Chris Cooper's got a lovely race shuttle, right? And I saw some, he didn't see this, I saw some lovely trailer envy. He, your trailer was just rolled in, and um, have you got on you, Friday? Yeah, and he just looked at the axles and he went, "Oh, I just oh. Off. He just went, "Oh," and walked off when he saw the trailer. No, no, he was very envious. Okay, so I think there are some subtleties in this that some Melody colleagues have missed, um, and I'm going to look forward to trying to present myself as being a little bit cleverer than everyone else, which always fails because I'm not. Um, first of all, best of luck, everyone, everyone that has been around motorcyclists. I've spent a bit of time around these lunatics recently, and they are quite a species apart. They love a van. They don't trailer anything. Their vehicle, mm. their race bikes are as close to them as possible because they assume everything is going to be stolen at every race meeting. So it's a van. Um, and I, I got a bit of a thing about the VW craze. These VW vans, whatever you call Crafter. them. The, the, Crafters, the, yeah. even, the, even the little ones. The craft, is a different, the craft is a different piece. It's a big, big man. You don't need something that big. No, you can get slightly smaller. But, anyway, keep but, going. The, but the normal, you know, what we'd call a transporter, Caravelli thing, they're not very good to drive. If you go, if you get out of one of those and drive a Transit, it's much, much nicer to drive the Transit. So I just have a daggy Transit, 15, 20 grand's worth. Try and find one that's got air con, which is very difficult because most fleet owners in the country are so mean they won't put air conditioning in their vehicles. You try finding a decent van with air con, just not possible. So um, that's why I have that. And, and I think when it comes to, the, to the, the, the car, most bike riders, rightly so, are totally unimpressed by the acceleration of a road car. So don't go down that route. You're never going to give them anything. And also don't try and replicate the bike experience. If you do the Isle of Man TT or you're racing superbikes, frankly, any car is going to feel a little bit juvenile. So 
I'm going to go for because I've seen this with bike riders do love a 911 turbo. So, oh, so many of them secretly have got a little 911 turbo stashed away because it gives them enough speed, but they like the engineering and they like the mm. fact they're not too big. And I think there is one car out there. And I'm, I don't want to pump the values up of these things because I've been eyeing one up myself, but here I go. A 997.2 manual is a rare thing. There, there's a few out there. It's a beautiful car to drive. It really is a nice car to drive. And it's got the nice, the decent dashboard with the proper sat nav and the touch screen. It's just a, so it's a nice. 997.2 manual, probably white or guards red or something. Nice basic spec and a transit van because the bike's got to be in with you. Is that fair lovely. enough? That yeah, cool. Lovely. Yeah, okay. lovely. Okay, right. Combo. We're going to do some music before we go. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have a chat with you in a minute, people. But uh, for reasons that you might know, I've had a fairly interesting week. Some stuff's happened that you don't know about. So I need calming. So I was going to put on some thrash metal or some prodigy or something because I felt angry earlier. But I want to be calming. So I've decided to change that whilst we've been on air. And I'm going to go for a bit of Bach. I'm going to go for Sheep May Safely Graze. But I want it played by a piano, please. I want oh. it played by a piano because I find it very soothing on a piano. And I'm giving away some of my inner geekiness there. But... Sheep may safely on a piano, please. Uh, so, Neil Clifford, next. I've been in America all week, so I've been mainly listening to John Denver. Oh. And please play Sun Sunshine on My Shoulders, John Denver. It's beautiful. 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 Uh, Manish. I'm going to go pop, and um, I'm off to Abu Dhabi tomorrow. Going to go and enjoy the race, I hope. Um and there was a piece of music I heard when I last went there completely randomly. It was Duran Duran. Oh, Mediter yeah. Mediterranean by Duran Duran. And the lyrics, because this is what makes me think about that journey all the time, across the sky, the jet plane following the wish that I was on that plane. And I will be. <laughs> eating my dates and having my coffee. Doing nice. That. Safe travels there. Thank Edward Lovett, what are you going to go for? I'm going to go for Jamiroquai. I know we've done a couple of Jamiroquais on here, but I, I stumbled across this on my playlist the other day, which is You Give Me Something. That's my that's good, though. Such a good piece of music. Yeah, yeah it's handy. Uh, Chris Cooper. So um, I thought about I thought about the week you've had, and you may say a few words in a moment. And I also looked at the M2 film on collecting cars this weekend, which was just fucking awesome. Um, so thinking about my mate, it's got to be Carly Simon. Nobody does it better. Oh, yes. Very good. Yeah. Right. Um, so before we go, uh, so we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, the uh, 21st. So the BBC has announced that Top Gear uh, will not be coming back for the foreseeable future. You can read into that wording what you will. Uh, as the person that was employed to do the show, I I have to view that as there's no more Top Gear. Um, I I've been doing it for eight years. Uh, I've never had a job more than two years before that. Um, I've got lots to say in the future about how we've ended up in this position, but for now, I'm just incredibly grateful to be given the opportunity to to have the boy's own job. It's possibly the best job in the world presenting Top Gear. Whatever anyone says, it's a privilege. Uh, and when you're 17 years old, ask yourself that question, would you take it? You'd grab it with both hands and you'd hug it and you wouldn't let it go. That's what I did. Uh, I've met some amazing people. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to all the people that no one ever hears about, all the camera crews, the tracking drivers, the pro drivers, the production crew, the runners that deal with people in the middle of the night like me. Um, you're all gorgeous and wonderful. I want to give you a massive hug. Uh, it's been uh, It's been a wild ride. I wouldn't have wanted to end it this way at all. It's not It's not a great way to end a working relationship uh, with, a, with a brand like that. BBC, of course, I remain well in contact with. But um, the main thing is that my friend Fred is okay. But it's been a tough year. We've never really talked about it on the podcast because, as you probably realised, this podcast was established in as much for me to be therapised away from from the BBC and from Top Gear. And my, my fellow idiots here have really, really helped me get away from it. It's been the most wonderful therapy to sit here and chat cars in that way. So uh, there, there'll be much said about Top Gear, not much of it from me yet. But uh, thank you for everyone that watched it. And uh, I'm sad that it ended that way, but I'm not sure they could have done anything differently. Um, on that note, the sales pitch. 
I haven't got a job at the moment. No, I have. I'm working collecting cars full time. Uh, and uh, do you know what? I'm more excited about the future for, for collecting cars than I am worrying about what's happened at Top Gear. That M2 video is a statement of intent. Go and watch it. We're going to be making Brilliant. content like that more and more and more. Back to the old style Chris Harrison car stuff that I love doing with a great talented team. So come to Collecting Cars. That's your destination for films now. Um, also, my book which I've got to promote, because I did last week, and I won't do it again, I promise you, but there's an audible version. If you, do, if you want to listen to it after the podcast, go and get the audible version. I'm running out of breath there. So I'm How long does it say, take to hear that on audible? How long is it? Do you know? No idea. It took me, two, took, took me three days to record it, I think two and a half, three days to record it. I bought four copies of your book. Did you? Yeah. yeah I've got, I've got I, I need some in-flight reading tomorrow, but I'm just debating. Should I just get it on Audible? Please I'll not. get it on Audible. But you have Please to listen buy. to my voice, though. Um, so thank you very much to my fellow podders, to Edward Lovett, to Chris Cooper, to Neil Clifford, to Manish Pandey. Uh, Manish, we look forward to hearing full feedback from the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, um, which I, I feel sorry for them. They've got a bit of a dead rubber on their hands, but they'll still put on a show, I'm sure. Uh, uh, and um, we will convene next week after I've done the ROC rally. So between now and then, I've got to do 350 stage miles and 1,100 road miles. So I think I'm going to be beaten to SH1T. Over and out. Good luck. See you Bye -bye. later. Bye-bye.